capable of uh, semi-automatic operation as well as manual operation. The input to this cabinet is 240 volts to the maximum of about 500 amps, single phase AC. This uh, represents the uh, load voltage going to the high voltage power supply transformer, which right now is set at 170 volts. This shows line frequency, line voltage coming into the cabinet at 240 volts. This is a differential voltage here at about uh, 52 volts. System volts, which shows approximately the same as load voltage because there's uh, no load applied at this time. And the two big meters on the right here show line amps, that is current being drawn by the line and current supplied to the load, zero to 400 amps. Uh, the controls down here in this portion are all of the uh, logic interface controls for the operation of the system, the rotary spark gap, as well as uh, safety interlocks to uh, protect the system and protect personnel operating the equipment. The cabinet uh, to the right and the lower part with the two red lights on operates uh, the rotary spark gap motor which is manually brought up to speed. It's a 10 horsepower motor that has uh, been uh, converted to salient pole synchronous operation for 3600 RPM and salient pole and you'll see the operation of that in a short time. So this is the uh, control center. The uh, scope that you see over here to my left right now is on storage. It's a model 468 Tektronix storage scope, a digital sampling storage scope. We've been taking waveforms of the uh, output of the coil this evening. We're using a standard uh, Kenwood type. Actually this is a Larson uh, two meter rubber duck antenna just as a uh, gimmick antenna input for the uh, channel A vertical input. And uh, right now we're set at uh, two microvolts per division of horizontal sweep. And we'll capture a waveform the next time we fire up the coil so that we can look at the oscillatory frequency and the amplitude of the coil. The vertical input is set on five volts per division with maximum attenuation put in and it's uh, completely off screen, which means I don't have enough input attenuation into the scope. I need to uh, add on to that. What you're looking at now is the high voltage power supply transformer that operates this coil. We have a Richard Silvera KC6 YQD, hmm. the assistant chief engineer of the transmitter station where all of this is set up here at KRLA, uh, standing next to it for size of reference. Uh, to the top of the feed-through bushings on the top of the transformer is nine feet high. This is a 100,000 watt or 100 kVA transformer. The uh, input winding is set at 240 volts input. We're actually running about 155 volts under load. Uh, the output voltage on the uh, high voltage terminals on top would be 36,400 volts for 240 in. It's probably around uh, 29 to 30,000 volts out under load right now. And the white wires that you see are going out to the capacitor bank of the uh, Tesla coil itself. So this is the high voltage power supply transformer that the rack that you previously saw controls and operates the Tesla coil circuit. What you're looking at here is the uh, high voltage capacitor bank. Uh, the white cap capacitors are being used along with the two blue capacitors in the foreground for a total capacity here of 0 0.270 microfarad capacity. This is the oscillation capacitor bank that works into the Tesla primary and oscillates as a uh, uh, sort of like a coal pits type oscillator circuit. That is a simple relaxation oscillator based on a certain amount of capacitance and a certain amount of inductance. Now to your left, you'll see the uh, rotary spark gap. This is the rotary spark gap, which is the uh, on-off switch that uh, does time sharing of the stored energy into the capacitor bank and then allowing that stored energy to be discharged into the primary inductance of the Tesla coil itself. At the bottom here, I'm going to ask James to follow me. This motor right here is a 10 horsepower motor, which has been uh, custom remachined to become synchronous saline pole at 3,600 RPM. 
the blower to the left of it right here, you see the squirrel cage blower here, is used to funnel cold air up inside this plexiglass tank because of the amount of heat that's generated. Without that forced air cooling, the uh, temperature inside this tank would reach over 400 degrees Fahrenheit in less than 10 seconds time because of the amount of power that's going through the circuit. Now as you can see, if I rotate these arms, you can see that these are the rotary arms itself rotating. And as you see, if uh, James, if you uh, focus in closely here, down in this corner, you'll see this is one of the four stationary electrode assemblies. And if I rotate this around, you can see that the uh, rotary arms come in close proximity to it. So that's where a spark takes place. And if you follow the circuit from the lower right to the upper left, you can see also up here, and it's in the opposite and direct position of it. So this is where the other side commutates. And then you rotate another 90 degrees and then it fires between the upper right here and the lower left down here. So it fires twice every revolution of this rotary arm. Here and here. That's a half rotation. Then here again and then here again. And that makes a full 360 degree rotation. That means that the mechanical pulse repetition rate of this rotary spark gap is 240 pulses per second. Now on the back side, which you cannot see that I'm pointing to here with my hand, is a uh, timing belt that's made out of an insulating material. It's what's called a positive drive timing belt. So the shaft of this rotor is locked to the shaft of the motor and it cannot slip because it is a positive uh, drive timing belt. So the synchronism between the motor and the charging frequency and the mechanical position of the rotary gap means that it is analogous to the same way that uh, a distributor works in a car. Dwell time and dwell duration is important to the proper operation of a distributor and a car's ignition system. And dwell time and dwell duration is vital to the operation of this equipment here because it's such high power. You'll notice the emblem here, which says Tesla Coil Builders Association. That's based out of uh, Queensbury, New York, run by Harry Goldman. And uh, I'm very proud to put that decal as a uh, cover plate on this gap. This gap, incidentally, is, uh, weighs approximately 600 pounds, and it's uh, manufactured out of one-inch thick plexiglass. These plates are one-inch thick plexiglass. And if you uh, were to focus, James, over in this area here, you'll see these spots on the surface here. That is where we've had previous mass destruction of the rotary gap due to the rotary electrodes hitting the stationary electrodes and flying apart with about the same explosive force as a grenade if it was shot off inside the box. We've remanufactured the gap and it's operational now and uh, is built in a way so that it cannot fly apart anymore. So that's the rotary gap. You'll notice that this is how the rotary gap is connected. You'll see that the uh, stationary electrodes here and here are connected by four inch wide copper strap inside. And they feed through to this brass plate that is three inches by four inches that comes out to these two cables. Now, my fist is about four and a half inches across, so that'll give you an idea of the size of this cable. This is 500 MCM, that is 500,000 circular mill cable. And there's two in parallel, as you can see. And this brass plate is three eighths of an inch thick. This uh, makes one connection to one side of the primary coil. And as I turn around here, if James follows the light, you'll see that this is actually a single turn primary. This is the primary of the Tesla coil. It's 12 feet in diameter. There are two individual turns, but they're connected in parallel. So that means one turn by filer. That is the primary of the Tesla coil. When the electromagnetic lines of force that are set up in this oscillation circuit between this and the capacitor bank, with the uh, spark gap doing the timing between charging and discharging the capacitor bank. When those lines of flux collapse, they transfer into this coil here. This is the secondary coil. It's 10 feet high. It's about five feet off the ground, so it's decoupled from ground the same way as you would decouple an antenna from ground. These are 30 turns of wire. This is number four wire. 30 turns. This is the secondary of the Tesla coil. And the form that it's wound on, these wooden uprights that you see, 
are made out of Sitka spruce, the same way as uh, Howard Hughes built the uh, spruce goose. The reason why Sitka spruce is used is because of its low moisture content and its high dielectric value. It works as good as porcelain at these frequencies. Remember, we're dealing with high frequency here, and the rest in frequency of the system is about 50 kilohertz. At the very top, you'll see a corrugated steel tube, which forms the top turn of the secondary coil. Now the voltage rise at that point, being high frequency and high voltage, is about 1,500,000 volts. And it is that voltage that is sent across outside of this yard, the inner sanctum, if you will. I'm shining the light here, and if James follows it along, you see a transmission line that goes out to the extra coil out there. The extra coil is 24 feet high. The aluminum polished toroid, which is a discharge electrode that's on top, is 8 feet in diameter and 3 feet in cross section. Now the voltage input at the bottom of the extra coil, which is on insulator 7 feet tall off the ground, is about 1,500,000 volts. The wire that's wound on that form, again on a Sitka spruce form, is 100 turns of number 8 wire, and the voltage rise at the top is about 14 million volts at the present time, which means arcs over 40 feet long. And the next thing you'll see will be more discharge of the coil. What you're looking at is the extra coil of this uh, Model 13M magnifier transmitter, originally designed by Nikola Tesla in 1899. This is my version of it today, 1995. Now, as you can see, I'm about six feet, two and a half inches tall, which means that I fit completely underneath this corona ring as the bottom first turn of this extra coil. And you've seen arcs that have come all the way down off the top of the toroid and struck all the way down to the ground, which means an arc length approaching 40 feet or slightly more. The toroid at the top is eight feet in diameter and three feet in cross section. And to the top of the toroid is 24 feet above the, the ground. The reason why the extra coil is on insulators, double stacked as you see, is because of the input voltage from the transmission line here. This is the uh, output of the secondary that we showed you previously on this videotape. So at this point that I'm holding on to when the coil is energized, that's 1,500,000 volts at approximately 500 amps of RF current. That is the injection voltage and the injection current into this helical resonator which stands above me as an extra coil. The voltage rise is magnified by the inductance ratio of the 100 turns here, which means we're putting out approximately 14 million volts at this point in time, with a peak current of about 100 amps RF per pulse at a rate of 240 pulses per second. What you're looking at is two microseconds per division, so that means that this is a two, four, six, eight, 
That's 10 microseconds almost for a full sine wave of primary oscillation. It dampens out after about 16 microseconds and then starts to pick up the secondary oscillation.